Well, good morning, everybody. Wow, what a crowd. And uh, what I, well, thanks for coming. This is our one, two, three, four. Is this our fifth? Yes, our fifth, fourth, fifth. Joined in by your persons, which is wonderful. We also have 37 or 38 people on Zoom. So welcome to all of you out there. Today, we're going to be having a wonderful speaker by the name of Lorraine McConaughey speaking as, uh, as an expert from the Museum of History and Industry. Many of you have been there, I'm sure. Uh, and her topic will be the Civil War in Washington Territory. I'm John Offterborough, president of our society and uh, also a committee member on our program committee. So if any of you are interested in helping us create new programs, come on down, talk to uh, Orly or me, we'd love to have your input and suggestions. Um, for those of you who are on Zoom, please confirm that you can see and hear us by using the chat button. So click down at the bottom of your Zoom screen and, and uh, we wanna know if you can hear us. So when you get there, you can, you can then select who you would like to send the message to by clicking on the drop down net, uh, little note next to the two, type in your message there and let us know what's going on. We'd also like to know how did you hear about this program and how many of you that out there know that Puget Sound had an underground railroad. And in the audience, how many people do that? Cup, okay, we've got a lot to learn today. So um, we will also have a Q&A Q &A session at the end of today's program. So please use that chat to send us any questions or comments that you would like to share. Holly will address the Zoom questions first. And for those of you in the audience, we'll hold your questions to the end. So now I'd like to know uh, if anyone has lived here in the Redmond or immediate surrounding area their whole life. Whoa, look at that. Okay, about five or six. And how many have lived here since somewhere in the 40s? Yeah, a few more. You were both here your whole life and the 40s. 1944. <laughs> 1944, since he was born then, obviously. Well, other people have been here a lot longer than that. So the following is our recognition of the first peoples here in Redmond. We acknowledge that we are the, on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples continue to steward these lands and waters as they have since time immemorial. We recognize Washington's tribal and indigenous or native organizations which actively create, shape, and contribute to our thriving communities. The Redmond Historical Society is committed to doing our part to engage with and amplify the voices of the native peoples and their tribes. And now, if you'll bear with me for a moment, Holly is going to adjust our screen so we can get our, our, our presentation going. Holly? All righty. Good morning, everyone. All right, and hold on just a moment. I'm just gonna pull up our presentation so uh, the folks on Zoom can view it as well. Okay, it should be all set. Okay, thank you, Holly. Are you going back behind the curtain? Will be. Okay. <laughs> Holly is wonderful. She is our uh, only employee, works here three days a week, and she is available to any of you who want to come in and get a longer view at uh, our beautiful little museum. We'd encourage you to call ahead just to know that she has time to open the doors up and we don't have volunteers actively working. And I'd like to thank all our volunteers who helped set this up, as well as Mary Sullivan and Cynthia Olson, who's provided some great treats out there. So enjoy those even on your way out. Uh, you've all seen something I had for you on your chair. This is to make model airplanes of, you know, when you get home. But in the meantime, it explains a, a new program we have called a legacy program. And you know, with the two or so years of pandemic, we didn't have a chance to do much in the way of uh, fundraising. But we depend on, on membership dues. Thank you all who are members and those of you who are going to become members. Uh, we also get money from grants and from fundraising. 
But uh, if this is of interest to you, when you leave, there's a table over there and I might be standing there to hand anyone who is interested a uh, more involved pamphlet that talks about ways that we can uh, benefit by your, your donations and so forth. It explains some things in there about being able to save some tax money and uh, other avenues of donation that may be helpful to us for our regular annual budget, as well as helping us sustain the life and longevity of the society in the future. And now I'm gonna introduce our vice president, Laura, Laura Lee Bennett, who is also our program chair and she will introduce our speaker, Laura Lee. Thank you, John. Can you all hear me? Wow, nice to see a full room, yay hey. Uh, before I continue with introducing our speaker today, I would like to call out our speaker at the Redmond Library this coming Wednesday. Barbara Collender, are you here? Raise your hand. Hello. Hi, good to see you. Barbara will be uh, doing a one woman monologue um, called I Cannot Think. It's basically an anti suffrage satirical piece at the Redmond Library this coming Wednesday. Excuse, yeah, Wednesday the 15th at 6 30. So hopefully you can all come to this free program. But back to the present. We have had the pleasure of hosting Lorraine McConaughey in the past such as in 2018, when she brought a reader's theater program that included songs, newspaper headlines, and diary entries about Washingtonians experience during World War I. I don't know if any of you were there, but it was really thrilling to participate in that program. Today, Lorraine brings us stories of the Washington Territory, which included Washington, Idaho, and the Western sections of Montana and Wyoming. This territory, so distanced from back East, participated fully in the Civil War, though no battles were fought here. From issues of race and slavery, and All right. I think um, it should all be sorted now. Again, apologies for the, the little hiccup there. Everyone knows how technology is and the best laid plans always go astray, but we should be all set now. And again, apologies, Lorraine, um, should be all set. Hello, everyone. Um, hi, uh, what a pleasure to see you all, colleagues, friends, members of the Historical Society, members of the general community. It's just such a pleasure after the desert of the pandemic to be seeing so many real faces and smiles um, and to be talking to everyone on Zoom as well. Um, it's just an extraordinary hybrid opportunity. My job here today is to make the arguments that Washington Territory in the antebellum wartime and reconstruction period had a significant Civil War exposure and experience. And this certainly goes against, it goes counterintuitively to everything that we've really been taught since we were very young. I can remember hearing it echoes in my brain that settlers came west to leave all that behind. And that was the phrase, to leave all that behind and to plant orchards and to raise chickens and to cut down trees and to fish for salmon and to look for gold. And just a moment's reflection, those of you who were born here, those of you who have moved here, you brought your ideas with you. And so did the newcomers to Washington territory, whether they came from Kentucky or Florida or Maine or Missouri. So they brought their ideas with them as much as they brought garden seeds or a Bible or a Winchester. So, I mean, that is really sort of the basis of this presentation, no. There were no battles in Washington territory, but it wasn't for lack of trying. 
there were fundamental disagreements about the most basic convictions of human ideals, about race, about slavery, about states' rights, about the expansion of the United States, about what the Democratic Party meant at that time and what the Republican Party meant at that time, what the risks and the opportunities were. So there were no battles, but there were profound disagreements. The closest I know is a duel in Olympia, but there were many people who stopped speaking to one another. There were many who resigned and left the territory if they had positions. And there were others who simply left the territory. One fellow walked all the way to Indiana from Port Orchard so that he could join the United States Army. Um, and, and we'll talk about that in more detail as we go here. Okay. So I want to frame this period from 1853 to 1865. So we're looking at the period from the separation of Oregon territory, or the separation of Washington territory from Oregon territory in 1853 through 1865. So the very end of the Civil War and the beginning of the Reconstruction period. What you see here is the territorial seal of Washington territory, and it holds in itself a, a remarkable story. Great art it is not, but it speaks to us. You see Lady Liberty there gesturing to the sky, and behind her is the Washington territory that the artist envisioned. So the log cabin of newcomers accompanied by a wagon as they have arrived in the, on native land. She gestures to the future where you see a, a side wheel steamer um, in a place that looks a lot like Venice used to look. So it's a very urban future. It's a sophisticated future. It's what this seal argues is coming. And on it, you see Alki, as most people say it, Alki. This is the only territorial seal in the United States that used a Native American term this from the Chinook trading jargon, that means in a little while. So in a little while, this is the accomplishment of the dream. This is the vector that the territory was going to go through. So earlier on, Laura Lee mentioned the huge dimensions of Washington territory, much larger than the state of Washington today. It included in 1860, all of Idaho and much of Western Wyoming and Western Montana. If you can't sleep at night, a really fun thing to do is to look at the census of 1860 online. There's only 12,000 um, enumerations in that census and they're fascinating. Where were people from? What were people's relationships with one another in a given household? How many African-Americans were there? How many Asian Americans were there? Very few of either of those groups. And what, what were the households like? There is um, no slave census for Washington territory. So it has been the task of mine of really the last dozen years to identify the only two slaves I've been able to find in Washington territory. And it was hard going, particularly the second one. Um, and I, I'll probably mention that later. But I just wanted you to see this huge territory. And of course, native people, this is native ground. And prior to the many waves of infection that, that came through this territory, and decimated means to take 10%. These waves of infection took much more than 10% of native people. When Lewis and Clark, Clark came down the Columbia River, they came to village after village where there weren't enough living to bury the dead. That's the kind of, you know, we've lived through a pandemic, which by comparison was mild to that. As this territory was organized, there's a political side to it that I think is interesting. A territory can't elect a governor. A territory can't elect representatives to Congress. A territory can't elect a surveyor general or a dog catcher. All of these jobs are appointments from Washington DC in this territory. 
So who was president when the territory was organized? Franklin Pierce. Who succeeded him? James Buchanan. Both pro-states rights, pro-slavery, Democrats. Everything you know is wrong about the Democratic Party and the Republican Party and what they represent. When we go back into 1860, we're looking at a very different landscape than we're looking at in 2023. But the important point here is that Washington territory was governed from Washington, D.C., and that the appointees I've described were political flunkies. They were people who had worked very hard to get Pierce and Buchanan elected. So you don't appoint people to these distinguished positions, a uh, governor of Washington territory, because they were on the opposite side of the aisle from you. You choose people with whom you agree. So the wonder of a place like the Redmond Historical Society, the wonder of a place like King County, Washington Territory, we have this intensifying lens because we're right here. So place-based history isn't sentimental and it isn't all about your families. It's about concentrating really large issues through a very tight lens. And that's, that's what we're going to be looking at today. So the Dred Scott decision, the Supreme Court of the United States, that's far away. What could that have to do with us? The Dred Scott decision legalized slavery in Washington territory. In fact, it legalized slavery in all of the territories. The federal census of 1860 counted who's here, what their relationships were with one another, what they did for a living. It omitted most native people unless there was a custom of the country relationship between usually a male newcomer and a Native American woman, then she might be included in that census. I'll be going back to these so you don't have to worry about that. The presidential election of 1860, oh my God, it's the eve of the Civil War. It's the ignition of the powder keg of the Civil War. When you see who the candidates were and you know that what became the Confederate States of America, most of those states said, if you elect Abraham Lincoln, we are gone. That was what was at stake in the election of 1860. As we get into secession winter, 1860 to 61, we resolve on April 12th, the attack on Fort Sumter, and then a lesser known event of national significance. That's very important to me because of my biographical research on Richard Dickerson Golson, a very obscure and uninteresting man. The Mayfield Convention was in Mayfield, Kentucky, which is stuck in your head because that's where there was a huge um, tornado uh, back uh, last year. But the Mayfield Con Convention on June 8th, 1861 was an effort by Golson and others to encourage the secession of Kentucky. Slave holding state. So, you know, there's hundreds of African American slaves in Kentucky. It seemed to have fellow feeling with Tennessee and South Carolina and Texas and the other slave holding states that had seceded. At the Mayfield Convention, the governor of Washington Territory spoke for 90 minutes about why Jefferson Davis would want Kentucky to secede. There's tremendous link between the Pacific Northwest and the effort for secession. And then finally, the Civil War Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments that really created a new nation, a new nation where people of, where men of color were citizens and could vo vote and where slavery was barred. These amendments are the beginning of reconstruction and we will see how they were resisted in Washington territory. Okay, wish I had three hands right now. So I'm a historian. So my job is to make arguments and support them with evidence. That's what historians do. And you glean the evidence by research. That's what it's all about. So the Eastern War was very present in Washington territory. I won't read these to you, you can see them. I'm gonna prove that, I hope. Race and slavery, huge here. Not just because of people of color, but because of native people. There's nowhere further to push 
native people. You think about the westering of newcomers to this continent. It's just pushing, 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 pushing to Oklahoma, further, 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 and essentially clearing an area for settlement. That was much more difficult to do here. The treaties that, that were quote unquote negotiated, I don't know if you can see me, I'm making little quote marks with my hands. These were, um, how can you have a negotiation? when the balance of power is so imbalanced. Native people had very little power. Those who were negotiating or imposing the treaties, this is a colonial act, it's an imperial act. Um, and that really brought the uh, race forward in Washington territory. Lincoln's election brought great change. I'm certainly gonna be able to prove that. The Pacific Republic and the Pacific Confederacy had some traction here through the Knights of the Golden Circle. And I think this is one of the most interesting areas of research that I've been able to do. The Knights of the Golden Circle were a national organization and they're kind of a proto Ku Klux Klan. They were a secret society with secret handshakes and secret woo woo kinds of um, interchange that you would say to a fellow Knight of the Golden Circle. And you can hear in its name, the kind of exaltation of, of, of these guys who were involved in this. Not everyone who was pro-Confederacy went South. Some stayed here. And those who stayed here, generally speaking, joined a chapter of the Knights of the Golden Circle in one of the counties of Washington Territory. And I'll tell you more about the mechanism later, but why were they doing this? What were they here for? They were here to assassinate the Lincoln appointees and remove Oregon, Washington, and California from the Union to form uh, a north-south uh, mm -hmm, vertical element of the Confederacy. So sweeping through New Mexico and Arizona to Texas, which was a Confederate state, and then to the east. Think what that would have meant if the Pacific Confederacy had been a reality. Civil liberties suppressed here. I think little is known about this. There were things you could not print in 1863. And if you printed them in your newspaper, it would be shut down. So, you know, First Amendment rights, not so much in wartime. Victoria becomes dramatically important as an, as an international haven, um, sometimes feared, sometimes um, enjoyed. But the fear was always that the, uh, great, that the United Kingdom, that Great Britain would recognize the Confederacy. Those of you who are students of the Civil War know this, that had that happened, it would have, again, dramatically changed the sort of balance of the war. And then the arc of the war itself. It's clear in journals and correspondence and editorials here in the newspaper that the war began to save the Union, but the war ended to create a new nation. That's a very different thing. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments changed the economic, social, political, and racial um, dynamics of the United States in a fundamental way. And that was not so much in the minds of such a large majority of political people and ordinary voters in 1860 as it was in 1865. This is Washington Territory's first newspaper. The first issue was February of 54. So the territory is created in 53, boom, you need a newspaper. Look at the title of it. It's the Pioneer and Democrat. And this refers to the party because Franklin Pierce was in the presidency. We have Pierce County. There's all of this sort of slavish acknowledgement and thank you so much, Mr. President, for giving me this job kind of thing. And this newspaper has more information about Washington, D.C. than Washington Territory because the territory was effectively ruled by the sitting president in Washington, D.C. This is our first governor, Isaac Ingall Stevens, and he is an interesting character. He will die at the Battle of Chantilly during the Civil War. And it was very unexpected, given his background, given his biography, that he would become a member, that he would become a brigadier general in the United States Army. On the contrary, most of his sentiments, most of his inclinations 
themed to be to the Southern wing of the Democratic Party, which we will see emerge in 1860 on the presidential ticket. What does that mean? It means, it means an interest in supporting and furthering the goals of states' rights, which is really kind of a cover for um, protection of an economic and social system based on slavery. And um, his, his transition is a tragic one and an interesting one. This is James Tilton. And James Tilton was an appointee as well, so a Democrat who worked very hard for the election of Pearson Buchanan, you know that by now. And he, all the little mini surveyors that he hired were all people who agreed with, with that point of view. He brought a slave with him to Washington territory. And that slave is Charles Mitchell. And we'll talk more about him in a little bit. It is an interesting thing about doing this kind of research. It's not easy. It's not easy research. James Tilton's a snap to research, no problem there. But researching the slave that he brought, oh my God, it is really, really tough. Um, and that's just the reality of collections. I don't know if that's here too, where it's hard to learn about marginalized people in an archival collection and easy to learn about marginalized people. Well, and, and hard to learn about marginalized people anywhere. I love these drawings. If you've come to my previous presentations, I think I always show them. They're the first drawings that we have of the settlement of Seattle. The artist here is sitting on the USS Decatur out in Elliott Bay, looking east across the water at the tiny settlement of Seattle. 20 buildings. It's 1856, it's January. It's the middle of the Treaty War. Native people have risen in holy horror after they realized what they had signed and what it meant. It had been negotiated in the Chinook trading jargon. I mean, it, it's, it's just a, a, a very sad um, period in our history. Anyway, the woods that you see there, so you're looking east across the bay at, at the settlement, the woods are thronged with Indians, as we'll see in the next image. But I want you to look at the Methodist church up at the north end of town, and you're reading right at the south end of town, that's Madame Damnable's house. So you see Yesler's mill in the middle. As soon as the mill begins cutting down all those trees and converting them into rough lumber, this becomes an international port. And sailors on ships expect to have a good time on shore. And Madame Damnable's house sprang up to accommodate that. But it was as far away from the Methodist church as it could possibly be and still be in the same soap. And this is the same art of Thomas Phelps looking down from above. And you can see here, the hills and woods are thronged with Indians. See that writing back there on the upper right. And here you see Yesler's wharf pointing out into the water. The sawdust, see the, the big ring of sawdust there. And um, it's just, I just think it's wonderful. But this is an idea of how slender the settlement was of newcomers here. Out in the, in the bay, you see the Decatur, the US Navy warship is the Northern sloop of war there. And then there's a lumber bark to the South. This is what Olympia looked like. This is the capital of Washington territory. It looks like Deadwood. So this is a very, it's a very Spartan place in terms of settlement. Uh, so in the Pioneer and Democrat, you would see ads like this, and I don't have the time to dwell on these, but I just want you to get sort of a gestalt of what settlers who had some money were doing. Very little money. This is basically a cashless economy unless you had a government job. If you were a federal appointee, you got a salary, but most people arrive with very little cash and it's kind of a barter economy. So to buy a new stove um, is, is really not a snap. And this guy, John Swan, a very, who's selling these fruit trees. I mean, people were trying to get local businesses started, trying to get some traction um, in terms of income. The Pacific Restaurant, um, this is an interesting tale. You see Rebecca Howard's name there at the bottom. Rebecca and Alex Howard were African-Americans. They owned this hotel and restaurant. And there are a number of interesting stories about them that 
looking at the clock, I don't have time to tell, but she is a presence as are the other 22 people of color in Washington territory. The Dred Scott decision. Okay, it's a meme from high school, right? So Dred Scott is a slave. He goes with a US Army doctor onto free soil. He comes back. He asks attorneys for assistance in arguing a case up through the courts that he should be freed because he had been on free soil for some long period of time. So the court decides, and it's very interesting. First, they say, Dred Scott, you are not a citizen. You have no right to stand before this court as a black man. You are not real in the eyes of the court. The second decision is no, you are still a slave because you are property. The idea of chattel slavery, where I own a person who is black, that is my property. And the Supreme Court said the constitution says that a man's property is his property and his property is a slave. So for Dred Scott, you're still a slave. And then finally, a man can take his property everywhere he wants to in the United States and he still owns it. That is what freed, you see Washington territory up there with the little pink stripes on it. That is what opened that huge area to legal slavery. So you could bring under the Dred Scott decision, 1857, you could bring your slaves here. We're gonna go quickly over these three events, the federal census, the escape of the slave Charles Mitchell, Victoria, and the election of Abraham Lincoln. This is the census. If you stay up late at night when you can't sleep, this is what you will see. And here we see the Tilton family in Olympia. And you see him up there at the top of 44 male. And there's a ditto mark um, to the right there. That's white, 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 white. And then you get down to the B, that's black. And that's Charles Mitchell. That is the child that was brought with um, the Tilton family from back east, where he had been born in Maryland. He was the son of a white oyster fisherman on Chesapeake Bay and a black house slave at the Gibson Plantation, Marengo. Slavery inheres in the female line. So regardless of the freedom of his white father, Charles Mitchell, who was named for his father, was enslaved. And he was given as a gift to James Tilton, whom you'll remember with the mutton chop whiskers, to take to the West. And their family story, you know family story can be eh, a little woo woo sometimes, but that he was given as a wedding gift to take to the West. So I said earlier that it's not hard to research James Tilton. Well, it's hard to research Charles Mitchell. So, Judy Bentley and I, who wrote this book together, we hired an African-American artist to imagine the mind of a 12-year-old boy who, and, 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 and he drew this image for our cover of what he imagined that would be like. Think about it. Here in the marketplace in Olympia, Charles Mitchell is approached by three men of color from Victoria, William Jerome, William Davis, and James Allen. And they argue, they tell him, do you even realize you're a slave? Do you even know that? Because we can hide you away on the Eliza Anderson, the international mail steamer that plies between Olympia and Victoria. And if you get to Victoria, you will be free because there is no slavery in the British empire. And they're, they're lecturing him, James Allen, whom I mentioned, is the cook on board the Eliza Anderson, the steward, if you will. And he says, if you are down at the dock at the landing, Percival Landing in Olympia at dawn on September 26, 1860, I will take you quickly down into the galley and I will hide you in a locker down there. And you know, what went through that child's mind? You couldn't look up on Google Victoria. I mean, he had to depend, he had to trust, he had to risk, but he did go down to the landing and he did get on that ship you see there, um, steamer uh, bound for Victoria. His story there is a long one. I'm looking at the clock. So we're going to just um, say that his escape, it was a nine day wonder. It really was a flashpoint for race and slavery in Washington territory. There were a healthy number 
of Republicans in Washington territory, like the Denny's and the Borans, um, who, who founded Seattle. They had come from Illinois to get away from a rising tide of democratic persuasion. So the Republicans at that time are, mm, they're, they're, they're not pro-states rights. They're for equality. They're for the freedom of slaves. They're for the abolition of slavery. And there is, is conflict. But this article is from San Francisco. So Charles Mitchell's escape on September 26th on the Underground Railroad of Puget Sound, the only person I have ever been able to find who took this route, um, became regional news, not national news. And this is what Victoria looked like in 1860. It is 20% Black in 1860 because of a massive exodus of African Americans from California. And California is the gold rush state, right? It's a state already. They had voted to come in as a free state, but as it turned out, um, there's many a slip twixt the cup and the lip. And what was in law was not what was in practice. And some of the leaders of the black community in San Francisco and Sacramento found that they were not ever called to serve on juries. They were not, when, when there was a burglary of Mifflin Gibbs shop, the police laughed at him when he brought a complaint to court. So they moved 500 black people from San Francisco and Sacramento to Victoria. And it is that community that created the Underground Railroad scheme that got Charles Mitchell out of Olympia and to this place. And you can see that forest of masts. Um, there's a gold rush. There's a lot of gold rushes. And people were streaming to the Fraser River gold rush. And there was more work than anybody could want. The presidential election. So here's how it fell out. We know with our presentist perspective that Abraham Lincoln's going to win, but they didn't know that at the time. His win was kind of assured when the Democratic Party fell in half, and it fell in half over slavery. So we have the northern wing, Stephen Douglas. We have the southern wing, which is going to be interesting to us, John C. Breckinridge and Joseph Lane. Joseph Lane is from Oregon. He was the senator from Oregon. He was, a, he was really the most eminent um, of the um, pro-Confederate Pacific Northwest notables at this time. During the war, the Portland Oregonian always identifies Breckenridge's farm as the, uh, the hub of anti-union activity in Oregon. But look who's managing the campaign. It's Isaac Ingall Stevens. It's our first governor. And if you look into the campaign materials, which were either written by Stevens or at least edited by him, they go out over his name. They were clearly pro-slavery, pro-states rights. And he, people are desperately trying to keep the union together and other people are desperately trying to leave it. There's a kind of incredible divisiveness in American politics that will tear this country apart. There's little to say, little I have to say about Bell and Everett. So what's going to happen here is that Abraham Lincoln is going to win. And in the wake of that, there's going to be a huge overturn of patronage, right? All of those Buchanan and Pierce Democrats are gonna lose their jobs. And there's gonna be a new round of Republican political toadies who are gonna get those positions from governor to dog catcher. This is the pioneer and Democrat so, you know, think about how do you get news, right? It takes a long time. There's no telegraph yet. So here we have May uh, issue of the Pioneer and Democrat repeating news of early April because they just got it. But this typography, this is high drama for um, the Pioneer and Democrat. I mean, they really never did headlines or anything like that. This is a big, big deal. And you see, you go down through the bullet points to civil war commence. And that is what this, this is about. Let's see, let me make sure I'm not skipping anything like super important here. Okay. So these five civil war issues 
The political patronage reversal, I've referred to that. You can imagine that. All the Democrats are out because there's no Democratic president. Resignations, treason, and secession. So there are perhaps 20% of the United States Navy and the United States Army men who resigned their commissions to go south. And some of them had been stationed here in the Pacific Northwest. Treason and secession are another matter, and we'll return to the Knights of the Golden Circle in a moment. Ongoing issues of race. The Walla Walla Statesman begins to publish in the middle of the war, and that newspaper is online, as well as Pioneer and Democrat, and you can search it, and it's interesting, the sort of elision of racism against Native people, as well as against Blacks. So the, the rhetoric is something like, my God, if we give the vote to black men, will we have to give it to native men? Um, it's, it's just, you know, we live among them. We do want to be equal to them. The challenges to civil liberty, I've referred to, I'll mention again, and then international affairs, ditto. So William Pickering, British uh, born, British raised, friend of Abraham Lincoln, a political uh, supporter of Abraham Lincoln, was appointed our governor. And he was called Little Pickwick because he spoke with an English accent. He didn't seem to be really American to many settlers here, but he got a lot done as I'll show you. This is Richard Dickerson Goldson who has claimed my whole attention for almost a decade and resisted many tenacious efforts to tug him apart. The last year of his life is an absolute tangle. But it is he uh, from Western Kentucky, from the Jackson Purchase area of Kentucky, slave owner, frontier doctor, frontier lawyer, uh, served like almost everybody seems to have done in the Mexican War, uh, mm, spoke at the Mayfield Convention for 90 minutes, did not succeed in getting Kentucky to sea seed. So after he sold his crops in August and September of 1861, he took his slaves, his wife, and his kids and went directly south to Tennessee. And that is where he fought and supported Confederate guerrilla fighting in the last year of his life. This is his letter of resignation from the State Department. I'm sorry it looks so bad, it's off microfilm, but it's great. Unwilling even for a day to hold office under a so-called Republican president. With my cordial thanks to President Buchanan for the honor of its bestowal, I hereby tender my resignation of the office of governor of Washington territory. It's just great to find something like that in primary material. You have such a wonderful archive here. And I'm so curious about what were the thoughts here about reconstruction anyway. So that is him. And again, you know, you'll see from time to time watercolors because I did an exhibit at Mohai and then I did an exhibit at Washington State History Museum about these very topics. And there's nothing to depict them. And the way museum people are put together, if you can't show it, you can't say it. So we had to make it up. So, so this is an image of an unknown, unnamed um, officer tendering his resignation, which you see there on the desk says resign on it. And he's leaving, he's going south. And this is a wonderful primary source an advertisement in the Portland Oregonian. Um, at the end of the second paragraph there, I go south. Going south became an expression that people used to say, I'm, I'm gone, I'm leaving, I'm a Virginia. People saw themselves as members or, or as citizens of their states as much as they saw themselves as citizens of the United States. So he's going to South Carolina, he's South Carolinian. He wants everybody to pay up their debts because he's leaving. Just great. George Pickett went south. He had been um, the, the commandant of the US Army base on San Juan Island. He was deeply involved in what we call the pig war. Um, under Richard Dickerson Golson, he would have cheerfully gone to war with Great Britain over the San Juan Islands. Um, and uh, that, that sort of hyper-nationalism, hyper-expansionism is really part of that. Pickett will go south. So Isaac Ingle Stevens, I've mentioned here, you see him in his Brigadier General's outfit. Everyone expected him to go south, even though he was not a Southerner, he was from Massachusetts. But his political idea 
ideals would have taken him south. But Fort Sumter and the rebellion changed his mind. And he said, I am a United States Army officer. I do not countenance rebellion. And so he went to war. He died at the Battle of Chantilly early on in the war. In September of 1862, which happens to be the same month and year that Governor Richard Golson died mysteriously in Tennessee. I'm going to have to, I, I've lost a little uh, time here from time to time. Civil War military men who had served in the antebellum Pacific Northwest. This could go on and on and on this list. I want particularly you just to read through it, but Isaac Sears Serrett interests me very much. I wrote about him quite a lot in my book on the Decatur. He joined the Confederate States Navy. He had been the captain of the Decatur that defended Seattle during the Treaty War against the attack in January of 1856. Um, anyway, I, I'm just gonna run out of time. But I do want to talk about the Knights of the Golden Circle because they're so amazing. Fascinating, a two dozen people in order to replace them with Confederate replacements and to take the territory out. We find representatives of the Knights of the Golden Circle, and there's quite a bit of scholarship about this. I mean, you can look up Knights of the Golden Circle at the University of Washington um, uh, library collection and, and find quite a few things. California, very strong with the Knights of the Golden Circle who tried to outfit a steamer in Victoria because it was thought that England would recognize the Confederacy. So outf out, outfit a steamer in Victoria take it south to California and seize a gold ship. Because remember, the gold rush is ongoing here. And these treasure ships, as they were called, um, are, you know, there's, there's not a Panama Canal yet. There's a sort of rinky dicky railroad across Panama. And some of the ships went around the continent and some of them transshipped their goods to that railroad and had to pick up on the other side. So there's efforts to outfit There's efforts to outfit these ships to seize a gold steamer. And one of the biggest efforts was in California. It was unsuccessful, but there's a, a couple of really interesting books about that. What kind of ideas did the Knights of the Golden Circle hold? Here we pass over into what you could not publish during the Civil War. This is Abraham Africanus, the first, his secret life. If we were to open up this brochure at the Washington State Historical Society, it argues that he had black mistresses, that they were going to begin the great work of miscegenation in the United States to create the new union where there would be no separation of the races, that they would be commingled, that African, uh, that Abraham Africanus was an autocrat, uh, a, a king um, and, that, and that he had backed away from the responsibilities of the constitution, his secret life. But this newspaper, which again, all I can do is show you an imagined image of what breaking up the press at the Portland Advertiser was like. This is one of eight newspapers in Oregon that were suppressed by the federal authorities during the civil war. The advertiser said, the hand of God should take out the tyrant Lincoln, and any man who aid, aids the hand of God is blessed by him. It's an open invitation to assassination. And there's just every single issue of these newspapers encouraged this kind of thing. During wartime, you simply could not publish that. And here we have the military breaking up the Portland Advertiser. So this is an abridgment of civil liberties. What about international affairs? I've mentioned quickly that Victoria was thought to be a haven for um, Confederates. And we know that uh, at, at the Dixie Saloon, which you know refers to the South, there were Confederate flags hanging outside in Victoria. And when the United States Navy ships came in, there were huge fights there between Confederate supporters um, and, and uh, 
and the sailors from the ships. I'm sorry, I'm kind of jangled here a bit. But what Pickering got done for us with the Lincoln administration is huge. The Homestead Act, think what that meant to Redmond, right? 160 acres, boom, 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 boom. And then the telegraph being completed up through the territory and then finally getting to Seattle. That meant you didn't have to wait a month for your news. Think what that meant. I mean, we're on our phones all the time, right? You know, gotta know what happened today. To wait a month, this made it reasonably instantaneous. And then the approval of the Northern Pacific Charter, this was rammed through. And then the land bodies to veterans. And I should have been clearer here. This is not Confederate veterans. This is the United States Army and Navy veterans who got an extra 40 or 60 acres, depending on the year, when they moved here. I am getting very close, but I wanna show you this. Reconstruction. We didn't become a state until 1889. This territory remained an adolescent for a long, long time. And this is a mass meeting after Lincoln's assassination by the friends of President Johnson and they are gathered to push back against the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. They are gathered to roll back the racial aspects of Reconstruction. This is huge. You see the first name there in the column is William Winlock Miller. William Winlock Miller was a tremendously influential independent slash Republican during the Civil War, but this racial equality was more than he and his colleagues could, could manage. Um, it would be wonderful to do a collective biography of these guys. So after the Civil War, veterans go west, both Confederate and Union. This is Clark Sturdivant. Do you remember Lake Sturdivant? Lake Bellevue used to be called Lake Sturdivant. It's named for him. He came west with tremendous mental problems. He had been in uniform for the entire war. He had been in a foraging division. He invalided out as insane. He came back in. He went to Bellevue and he, he lived um, on Lake Bellevue. He took a series of custom of the country native wives there. And the rumor was that he killed them and that they were buried in the front yard. He was an extremely heavy drinker. I was a volunteer at Mary Moore Museum before um, it, it went, before it joined the Eastside Heritage Center. And there's diaries there where young people growing up remembered that they had to avoid Sturdivant's place. Their mothers made them walk all around it to get to school because he was so feared and dangerous. Don Connor, African-American um, veteran with others of his friends and family in Tacoma. So Bellevue, Tacoma, and then Tacoma again. This is an optometrist in Tacoma who had come from the Confederate States Army and he set up an optician shop in Tacoma. These met veterans, a healthy percentage of them, joined these sort of fraternal organizations after the war. The Grand Army of the Republic for the United States, the Northern veterans, and the United Confederate veterans. And here we have Robert E. Lee, um, which was part of uh, one of the applications. The, the daughters of the, See, the United Daughters of the Confederacy hold the records of the United Confederate veterans here in Washington. And then there's the Great Reconciliation. Um, the Civil War, as, as Reconstruction softened, the amendments were passed, but their enforcement softened considerably. And we find the emergence of the first Ku Klux Klan, I would give anything, to be able to see the secret membership lists um, of the Knights of the Golden Circle and look for a transition to the Klan. I'm sure there is one. How can you prove that? I don't know how to prove that. But this is 1891 here. This is a reenactment of a Civil War battle. It's in Tacoma. It's a popular entertainment. And the Civil War fell behind the United States with, there's, there's lots and lots of photographs of gray bearded, um, veterans of the civil of the South on the one hand and the North on the other shaking hands. And one of the coolest ones, and I didn't put it in here, is shaking hands over Cuba. Because with, with the rise of the Spanish-American War in the 1890s, 
you know, there was this sort of sense of unity um, against the imperialism of Spain. So this is what I tried to do today, what I tried to demonstrate today. And in the interest of time, I will not talk about that anymore. That's me. That's my email address. If you want to find me, um, I'd be happy to take questions now. Hi, Lorraine. Um, I thought we'd just maybe take one or two questions from Zoom since I know we did cut into your time a little bit today and I do apologize for all those uh, technical difficulties. As I mentioned, it was just the, the internet connection here at the old Redmond Schoolhouse. It's a, a challenge we have in this building. So I really appreciate you, um, your flexibility and your patience as we figured out those problems today. Um, I was wondering if, as we get a little bit of Zoom questions in, if you could tell us a little bit more about your um, your research process and sort of what interested you in this topic. I was an employee at the Museum of History and Industry. I was the public historian. Um, and we had a show coming from back east from, um, I don't know, the strong, let's say the strong museum. I'm not sure which it was. And it was about the Civil War in the United States. And my job as a historian was to root this in our local experience so that the exhibit wasn't like an asteroid that had fallen into the gallery, you know? So all my growing up learning life here, I had been told there is no civil war to talk about in Washington territory. People came here to get away from that. They came here to plant orchards and dig for gold. Well, I hope I've um, shown you that people brought their ideas with them. And I went and at that time you had to read on microfilm and I thought, where will I start? Well. I'm going to start with the pioneer and Democrat in the late summer of 1860 about the election. Surely, even though territorial citizens could not vote in that election, they would have been interested because the place was run from Washington, D.C. Well, they were. And there's lots and lots of editorial comment about that. So I'm diligently taking notes. What am I going to put in the exhibit? And I saw a tiny headline that said fugitive slave case. And I had just been working on some slavery issues and fugitive slaves in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I thought, oh, great, I'm really interested in this. Well, it was Charles Mitchell. And it was Charles Mitchell's escape from slavery of James Tilton in Olympia to Victoria. That's what that was about. And it absolutely hooked me. Um, I, I had to know more. And you know, I have co-opted a black story as a white historian. That's not particularly comfortable, but it was my job at the time. And Judy Bentley and I wanted to write Charles Mitchell's story so that young people would know that, that this had happened and that older people too. We have such complacency about race here um, as though we're just so very, very different than Virginia. And it was important, I thought, to show that race was complicated here. Yeah, absolutely. I think you've certainly done a, an excellent job of that today. Um, and we did have a, a comment from um, someone in our Zoom audience. Um, they mentioned that there was a family of African-American descent in Tumwater, uh, that George Bush and his family should be on the census um, because the Bush Simmons family settled here in uh, 1844 or 1845, and he lived there until his death and until 1866. Uh, so it sounds like we have some folks out there making making connections as well. I wish I could demonstrate connections between Charles Mitchell and the Bush family. I, I haven't been able to. Um, there are some things it's just very difficult to research if the evidence is not there. I think I feel mm. safer talking about um, uh, Alex and um, the owners of the hotel in, in Olympia, because Charles Mitchell lived in Olympia, I'm quite sure they would have seen one another. Although again, I have no evidence of any conversation or even a wave of the hand. Um, and I also, before we close out our Zoom, I wanted to give you an opportunity um, to tell uh, folks on Zoom a little bit more um, about your book, where they might be able to access it since they're not here today, they won't be able to buy it in person, but where could they get more information about that? Maybe I can hold it. So this is what it, this is what it looks like. Um, it's University of Washington Press. We're um, looking forward to a, a second edition, probably in two years. 
But Judy Bentley and I worked with the illustrator, African-American illustrator who did the cover. And it is, it was an extraordinary experience because we, we wanted to get Charles Mitchell to Victoria. He went to school there. He went to the college preparatory school there. He lived in that large, prosperous black community in Victoria. And, you know, he had something of a new family there. Um, and at the end of the book and throughout the book, you'll find italicized sections where Judy and I tried our hand at what is essentially historical fiction, trying to get at motivation, because you, you don't find that often in the primary sources. You know, you can, you can make a timeline, this happened, that happened, that happened. But what people felt and thought, um, in, in the book, we have italicized sections where we fought it out, she and I, like, like two crusaders. Um, what can we possibly claim with any justification? So I'm sort of proud of, of our approach to that. And anyway, uh, the book, where's the book available? Books should be available at, at your bookstore. But if, if you want to patronize a proper um, Brooks and Mortar bricks and mortar bookstore, but it's easily available on Amazon. It's in the King County Library System. It's in the Seattle Public Library System. It's it's not too hard to find. Well, thank you, Lorraine. Um, and we will be sending out um, more information, you know, links and information about where you can get that book to all of our Zoom attendees um, following the presentation. Uh, but I am going to end our Zoom here. We will have a little bit more time for um, questions in person. And for those of you who attended on Zoom, if you have any questions or feedback about today's presentation, you can contact me, Holly Turner, at manager at redmondhistoricalsociety.org. And join us again next month on April 8th for another very special Saturday Speaker Series program, All Over the Map, Surprising Places and Place Names of the Evergreen State with broadcaster and historian Felix Spinell. Find more information about this event on redmondhistoricalsociety.org as well as details on our upcoming April programs, visits to our display space, and more. Um, for those of you joining us in person to get today, we'll be coming around with a mic for additional questions. Thank you for your patience, and to everyone else, enjoy the rest of your day.